them they've got nothing to worry about or hide from. Uh, maybe just so my, 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 my version of events can be heard by the public, as it never was really heard. Our investigation shows how Witness B plays a crucial role in a sequence of events which leads us straight to the suspect's front door. His account fundamentally challenges the suspect's alibis and helps us piece together exactly what happened that night. I went back to my girlfriend's house after work, uh, uh, left there about half ten and jumped on a bus uh, to go home. By the time Witness B boards the bus, Stephen is already dying on Wellhall Road. Local girl Kelly Kavanagh was passing the scene. What's going on? Looks like he's been stabbed. Before they got home, Kelly's sister Louise bumped into a friend. Hey, Louise. You all right? Yeah. He is known by police as Witness K, and she tells him what she saw. You know what? I think I might go up there and have a look. I'll see you later. See ya. At about the same time, Witness B's bus is passing the scene of the stabbing, but from his seat, he doesn't see Stephen. As I got down to a little roundabout, as I looked over, I see four people running away. One of whom I realised who it was, Dave Norris, and one who I actually did think was him or his brother, and that was Neil Rakel. They looked like they was trying to get away from something. They looked suspicious, basically. Then about a minute after that, I got off the bus, started walking home. But before he got there, he bumps into Witness K, are, who was on his way to the scene. Yeah, I tell you what, there's something been happening up there by Wellow. B went home, but he was left wondering if what K had told him was linked to what he'd just seen. Next night, I, I got home from work and I'd heard word of mouth through people that I knew that someone had been killed up Wellow Road, and that's when my brain started working overtime, thinking, I wonder if what I see last night might have been something to do with that and whether what Witness K had mentioned might have had something to do with that as well. We can accurately time B's sighting because records show a police vehicle passed him at 10.54, but that means almost 15 minutes had passed between the attack and B's sighting. So where did the suspects go during that quarter of an hour? Well, they had friends here in Dixon Road and a police source told me how he thought they'd gone there to clean up after the attack. Then local woman Tammy Vosper told me about a conversation that she'd had with a boy who knew the gang. I bumped into a friend of mine called, who I grew up with in school, and um, he said, did you hear what happened? And then he told me that um, the A Court brothers, um, Dobson, Norris, had gone up to have a rah, and they'd gone over and stabbed a black boy. And then, after that, they've run over to Dixon Road to one of their friend's houses, washed the clothes, wiped the knife off, cleaned themselves up. And what did the suspects do next? Well, Witness B wasn't the only person to see the gang that night. Soon after 11pm, another witness, known by the police as E.E., e., came out of his house to see what was going on. While talking to the police, he spotted both Acourt brothers at the junction of Wellhall Road and Downman Road. This punches a huge hole in the suspect's alibis. E.E. E. won't give an interview because he doesn't want to grass, but we've confirmed that he stands by his story. Golf X-ray, golf mic somewhere. About 40 minutes later, Witness K decided to pay the Acourts a visit. He knew of their reputation, and after a chance meeting with E.E., e., had put two and two together. Well, look, there's been a stabbing down Wellow. Yeah. Well, you boys don't know nothing about it? Why should we? Well, fucking us, was it? Now, look, I'm just telling you, like, he's dead. So now you told us, you can fuck off, can't you? The man known as Witness K then came straight round to his friends, the Tylers, who lived in here, to deliver his tale to an expectant audience. Some say he saw them washing a knife. Others say they were changing their bloodstained clothes. K eventually gave a statement to the police, saying that he saw both the A-Courts and Dobson there 
behaving suspiciously. But after that, Witness K refused to cooperate any further. Well, that didn't take very long at all. Um, I spoke to Witness K very, very briefly before he stormed out of the room. He was being fiercely protected by his parents and all three are clearly very affected by, by this case. They said they had to move away from the area because of the, the stress. What I encountered there was a family who have had enough of the Stephen Lawrence case and are frankly probably still very, very frightened indeed. I asked Tammy Vosper to help me find out what Kay had seen that night. She got me to someone who'd heard his story first hand. You spoke to either that night or the day after. So what did he tell you about what you saw that night? Listen, he only told me what, what everyone else has heard, that he knocked at the door and they see them like panicking at the door and apparently one of them were washing clothes in, in like the... Uh, um, uh, kitchen. He said he see one of them put in something in the washing machine, and like it was a lot like, of panic at the front door and all that. And said like, if you've been out and you stabbed someone tonight, then like you want to be careful because the fella's dead. Like, and did they admit it? Well, well no, I've said never. They've never admitted it ever. Like, do you know what I mean? Never ever admitted it. I suppose that's why they've got as far as what they've got. Other witness statements corroborated this testimony. Whatever it was that witness case saw that night, he and his friends were in no doubt about what the Acourt gang had done. So how does it all fit together? The attack happens at 10.40 and the gang make off down Dixon Road. I believe they head out in their friend's house before re-emerging about a quarter of an hour later to see if the coast was clear. They wouldn't have seen Stephen's lifeless body because he'd managed to run 200 metres up Wellhall Road before collapsing. So they decide to take the long way back to the Acourt's house on Bornbrook Road and at 10.54, Norris and three others are seen by Witness B running along Rochester Way. But maybe curiosity got the better of the A-Courts because they peel off from the rest and are seen at just after 11 by Witness E.E. E. back on Wellhall Road. And we know that at least four of the suspects are at the A-Courts house by about 11.45 because that's when Witness K sees them. Counting Dwayne Brooks' original evidence, that's a total of at least five separate sightings of various gang members. And that's quite a lot for a bunch who say they were at home all night. I'm absolutely adamant that I see Dave Norris and one of the A courts that night. Whether they're lying because they did the murder, which I believe might be the case, or whether they're lying because they had something, some involvement in the murder in some way, maybe, I don't know, but they're definitely, definitely lying. Come on, let's be real, Mark. Everybody knows that they killed that boy. Everybody knows. The public knows. Everybody knows. The police themselves. You know. I know. What's going wrong? Why them boys ain't been brought to justice? We believe we know where the suspects were that night because they were spotted at various points near the scene. But what do they say about where they were and can they prove it? Well, in 1999, they went on TV to plead their innocence. It was the first time they'd properly answered questions about the murder and I wanted to see if any weaknesses in their alibis had been exposed. Were you at home? Yeah. So you were at home for the whole night? Yeah. Did you go out at all? No, not what I'm aware of, no. Because I've been racking my brains for the last... since the inquiry to, to, uh, to come in, because I knew I was going to be coming on telly, obviously, so I want to say something. So I've been thinking and thinking and thinking, and I tell you the truth, the person who, who told me more than likely where I was was my mum. She said to me, she's been trying and trying and trying for so many years to think, and the only poss possible explanation she could think is that I was Raymond McGill, and that's where I think I was. Really, David? Well, as soon as this programme went out, the police launched a desperate attempt to find this girlfriend. Did they find her? No. Does she exist? Almost certainly not. And what about Luke Knight? Interviewed by Detective Sergeant John Davidson, he says he was indoors all night. Do you remember the night that it happened? 
Well, I was in that night. Yes, I would like to say, yeah. yeah. That's Thursday, the 22nd of April, yeah. 1993. Yes. But he was dropped in it by his best mate's mum. Patricia Acourt told the police that Luke had actually been round to her house, visiting Neil and Jamie on the night of Stephen's murder. But Luke Knight wasn't the only one caught out lying. So was Gary Dobson. Why did you not tell us you knew Norris? What's the cover up with Norris? I, I don't know Norris. I know of a David Norris. I don't know a David Norris. He's he's the madman with a knife at the moment. Isn't he? I know of a David Norris. I've heard his name mentioned, like just in conversation or whatever, saying I. Uh, Whatever, I've you not don't realise the seriousness of it. Of course, yeah, of course I do. But Dobson had been photographed with Norris only a week before this police interview, also conducted by Detective Sergeant John Davidson. He lied about knowing Norris, and I also believed he was lying about where he was on the night of the murder. I must have arrived home at about quarter to five in the evening, about quarter to five, five o'clock. And from then on, stayed indoors. You stayed indoors all that night? No, I, I popped out at quarter to twelve, that's quarter to midnight, ran to a friend's house to get a CD and then came straight back. I was only out for 10, 15 minutes at most. However, just ten days earlier, Dobson told the police he'd stayed at home all night. What had changed? We think he realised his story was falling apart, as detectives had now discovered he'd been at the A-Court's house an hour after the murder. I began to dissect Dobson's alibi. At the time, his parents Stephen and Pauline and their friends Christopher Myers and Sheila Bubier said that he was at home. Detectives later arrested them due to inconsistencies in their statements. No charges resulted, but I was convinced there was more to investigate. This is Talk Radio, across the UK on 1053 and... 10 In 1999, Dobson brazened it out with a public charm offensive on radio. I wanted to see if he might have slipped up and given anything away. This is the first opportunity that one of those suspects, Gary Dobson, has had to put his case live. I look at you now and I swear to you on my mother's life that I am not guilty of this crime. Who's there in the house with you? You've got to remember it's not a night that I've set in my mind as been the most important night of my life as well, my it's quite an easy question. Who was there in the house with you? Well, if you let me finish, I'll get right. to it. Right. And what I'm saying but during close examination of this interview, I found a major flaw in Dobson's story. His parents' friends, Bibier and Myers, declared in their statements they left Dobson's house at approximately 11.10, leaving Gary indoors with his mum and dad. Christopher Myers says, He shook my hand and kissed Sheila before we left. But listen to this. Your mother was with you on the night of the murder? Yes. Were you also with the A-Courts? I visited the A-Courts house around... With your mother? No, no, not with my mother. Oh. My, my, I left my mum and dad indoors with their friends. I then went round to visit the A-Courts, round at their house, just as, I, just as I generally did every I left my mum and dad indoors with their friends. I left my mum and dad indoors with their friends. So Gary says he left them indoors. And they say they left him indoors. They can't both be right. Especially when Myers and Bibier would have been gone for at least half an hour by the time Gary claims to have said goodbye to them. Even Gary's dad, Stephen, had trouble with the sequence of events. In 1993, he told police, Until I was told by his solicitor, I didn't realise that he had gone out at all. But three years later, with a dramatic improvement in his memory, he now says, When my wife and I were in bed, I heard the sound of the front door shutting. I thought it must have been Gary going out. This simply did not make sense. I had to confront Dobson with these inconsistencies. 